Thanks for the invitation to be at this conference. I haven't been to this uh, particular conference before, and I have to say I was a little bit, uh, not exactly puzzled, but uh, it took some thought to think a little bit about what I was gonna talk about around forest tenure reforms in a conference that's on agriculture, um, focusing a little bit more on in individual property and rights, and I'm focusing on forests and conservation and collective lands. So uh, what I've done is select a few key topics um, that I think are out there and of interest and uh, perhaps are things that have come up in, in your own work. So first, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna talk about the methods because I'm really drawing on a, over 10 years of research in different countries around these questions of forest tenure reforms, um, but I will present a small conceptual framework just so you can kind of get a sense of where I'm coming from. Um, how do I go down on that? Let's see. I have some notes in here. I don't want to make sure I don't miss them, but I'm trying to get in. Okay. So um, I should mention, however, that most of my work has been in Latin America, or I've worked in, I've coordinated re research around the world in Asia, Africa, and Latin America, but it's where my home base is. It's where I've done most of the research on the ground, and it's what I'm most comfortable talking about. So sometimes I shift easily into talking about uh, large uh, indigenous territories, which you'll hear some of in the next few minutes. Um, I'm gonna talk about briefly what's special about forest tenure reforms. I think it's important to get a bit of a sense of what's different about maybe agrarian reforms um, in the past with these forest reforms that have been happening more recently. And I'm also gonna talk about rights for whom. This is something that came up in the tenure session this morning. Uh, who's getting the rights on behalf of the collective and the different issues around that. I'll talk about uh, the big question that some of many of us may have, which is do indigenous peoples and local communities actually conserve forests, uh, which is often one of the big arguments for why they should be granted rights to their resources. Um, I'll talk very briefly about some uh, research on rights and food security to connect it to the conference and also raise a couple um, concerns about that, and then a brief summary of um, of my presentation. So this is sort of a, a very simple model around the challenges and opportunities of forest tenure reforms. And I'm not going to explain the whole thing, but what I want to point out is that in the center there you see you have the reform, you have implementation, and you have the outcome. That sounds very linear and, and simple, but in fact it's an extremely complex process. The reform is never a single reform. It's often many reforms. Every policy has a regulation and a law and then institutions that have to implement it. There can be 10, 20 years between the first reform and the actual institutions for implementation for actually establishing uh, collective forest tenure rights. Um, and on the right-hand side there, you can see the two terms, appropriation and opposition. And what I want to emphasize there is that there's a whole history of research on formalization of rights that shows that in, even when these formalization processes historically have been aimed towards uh, marginalized groups and guaranteeing rights and securing tenure for these groups, in fact, the, the rights are often appropriated by someone else. So there's been elite capture, and many reforms have actually benefited uh, the people they were not intended to benefit. And this is definitely a challenge in forest tenure reforms as well. And the other word there is opposition, and that is outright opposition to granting rights to indigenous peoples, uh, challenges for the access to resources, challenges for the land themselves, it, the land itself that this is um, that is being granted. So it's an extremely dynamic process. Um, the most important thing, really, to understand is the reform is never done. It's never over. Uh, look at Brazil. <laughs> we thought indigenous rights there were very secure. We now have a new president in Brazil who's challenging all of those rights that have been granted. So it's a constant uh, battle. And um, so there will always be resistance, there will always be change, and there will always be adjustments that, adjustments that need to be made. And these are all in a context, in the different individual country contexts, local contra context and history. The actor coalitions are key to this in terms of both supporting reforms, but also those who fight against those reforms. Um, there's often a, a, a lot of conflict around this and threats to tenure security. So that's sort of my general um, Frame, the framing that I've, that I've built over the years after working on this topic. So what are some of the distinct, distinguishing features of forest tenure reforms from agrarian reforms? This isn't true of all forest tenure reforms, but I think there are some key 
dynamics that tend to be more common. So first of all, rights are often granted with the understanding that forest resources should be maintained or restored. So the forest is, part, is often very much part of the reform with expectations and even rules sometimes. The alienation rights to land are usually still held by the state. So forest land usually cannot be legally divided and sold, nor can it serve as a bank guarantee. Quite different than uh, agrarian reforms that are granting individual property rights. Tenure rights for, for forest resources or for forests are essentially for multiple users of various forest resources. You may actually get a right to part to a resource in the forest and have very strong regulations about the, the things you are allowed or not allowed to do, such as, for example, many reforms that will allow um, use rights, but not commercial rights and not logging rights. So most of the reformed forest lands are being formalized as collective or communal properties, as I said previously. And this also raises another issue, which is about um, who's representing that collective, who is the community. So it either means recognizing some kind of previously existing governance structure or building a new one, which brings in all sorts of other issues around these reforms. So this is a nice uh, graphic I drew from a, a publication from a colleague of mine who had been looking at reforms, uh, forced rights models by, by region around the world. And so you can see just, you don't have to read the details, but by glancing across there, there are many, many different models of reform. And what he's done is put the sort of the lower uh, level rights on the left and the greater rights on the far right. And those are really the titled territories, you know, full title um, that you see more often in Latin America. And you can see how the regions uh, kind of range across these with Africa a little leaning more towards the left side with fewer um, rights actually being granted and uh, Asia somewhere in the middle and not in America more to the right. So globally, the rights in, uh, sorry, WRI, the World Resources Institute, says that about 50% of land, and it, can, it could even be up to 65% of land globally is held by indigenous people or local communities. But only some 20% of this is actually formally recognized. Um, again, so there's all sorts of different models. Um, and titling territories is generally seen as the best option, right? It's the most secure, it's the longest term. Um, but we'll see what some of the problems with that. Um, and still today, most forest lands are owned and administered by the state. Africa, this is 92% of forest lands. Asia, it's 65%. And in Latin America, 48% of the land is still owned and administered by the state. Another point about these for reforms is that they have what um, Fernanda Almeida calls legal, different legal entry points. And I actually see many different ways in which these reforms have occurred, including decentralization, conservation, et cetera. But when she looks at the laws that are actually granting these rights, there are, there are three main groups. One is those that are focused on rights, granting rights and recognizing ancestral claims. And the other, is, the other main one is conservation. Um, so there's, there are reforms specifically uh, through conservation or forest laws or environmental law um, that are granting rights. And then her third group is those that don't fit into either of those. And in some respects, these have a little bit more, they're more about regulation, and they tend to have a little bit more of a livelihoods focus. So hence my title this morning was, you know, is it for conservation, is it for rights for conservation or for livelihoods? What, are, what, is actually being, what is actually the goal of the reform. And so that entry point usually is also helping define the, the primary goal. If it's rights, it's recognizing rights. And those are usually coming out of movements that have been demanding rights. If it's conservation, there's also a stronger expectation and often l rules specifically about keeping that forest standing. So now we move into the rights for whom, who represents the collective, who has authority over the territory. This is really um, one of the big questions. And it, raise, it raises issues both about internal governance um, of these collectives, but also external relations. So in terms of internal governance, um, we tend to assume that these collectives already function as collectives with an existing and legitimate governance body. And that may be true in many cases. In many customary communities, this may be correct. But I'll show you a couple examples in a minute where the, the entity that was granted um, the rights, there, at, there was no previous governance entity at that scale. 
Um, but we need to understand how decisions are made internally. Does this entity have norms or rules regarding governance, how they govern, who are the members of the collective, how are different members, such as women, represented in the collective itself? Are they full members? Are they voting members? Are they represented on the governance body? Um, and what account accountability mechanisms exist uh, to prevent corruption and the elite capture in these collectives? And in an article written by Anthony Stocks in 2005 called Too Much for Too Few, he argued that the democratic representation at the grassroots level is an extremely vulnerable aspect of the indigenous land movement. And that was almost 15 years ago, and I think it's still very, very true today. Um, but one of the reasons that that internal governance may be so challenging is partly because of the external pressures, um, often, or at least sometimes, coming on these indigenous uh, communities and territories. So with, when we look at the external governance, um, the important thing to recognize is there's nothing really simple or straightforward about choosing who's going to represent this collective um, when rights are form formalized. It means granting the right for someone who's being designated on behalf of that community to sign contracts, um, to sell timber, um, consent, which may or may not look like free prior and informed consent, may simply mean the approval of one authority, or as uh, someone was describing earlier this morning, one community meeting where people, you know, are they really being very informed, or you know, how, how much can you learn in one community meeting to decide, make a decision about whether you're going to give away or sell or uh, resources or even a part of your territory. So what happens is that these issues, these uh, processes of recognition or formaliza formalization may lead to substantial conflicts, may be rooted in substantial conflicts over resources and power and competition to establish the legitimate authority. So who's actually going to have control um, of this territory? And for external actors seeking control over people and resources on the ground, controlling the territorial authority is key. So I'm just going to really briefly talk about two examples of this, one from Nicaragua and one from Bolivia. And basically what you have is sort of this three-way dynamic. You have the central government, you have the regional government. In the case of Nicaragua, this is an autonomous regional government um, that was mostly, at that time, indigenous peoples. And then you have the communities themselves. And there's a whole history of struggle between this autonomous coast region and the central government. And at the particular moment when the government actually agreed to grant titles, the government was, uh, so they, they were in a, there was an alliance between the indigenous leaders and the central government. But their uh, struggle over territory was very much rooted in the history of struggle between the coast regions, the Caribbean coast regions dominated by indigenous peoples and the central government and the rest of Nicaragua, the state of Nicaragua. So when, they, when it came time to define these territories uh, or what was going to be titled, the push was very much for not community level titling, but uh, a broader scale titling of multiple communi community territories, which was to some extent what communities said they wanted, but in, some, in very specific cases, the indigenous leaders were actually manipulating the communities to get the kind of territories they wanted. And that was both a political struggle to make sure they were covering the whole territory and not leaving spaces in between, but it was also you know, some pretty dodgy personal interests in controlling the timber market and other things going on. So um, in the end, they end up sort of imposing their territory structure and I could go into this in much more detail because it's a case that I, the case I know best. Um, but you get an idea of the dynamics. In Bolivia, very similar situation, but the, the tables were turned a little bit. In Bolivia, this case is in the Guarayos territory of lowland Bolivia in Santa Cruz. You have the same three-way struggle with the central government, the regional government, and the indigenous communities and their federation. But in this case, the regional government was very anti-indigenous. Um, and the central government, Evo Morales, gets elected, an indig indigenous leader. So you end up with a, another, a different kind of dynamic where the, um, the regional government is aligning with the economic elite, basically doing uh, organizing and, and uh, manipulating leaders to, to promote land grabbing, such that the territory of Guarayos, the last time I saw the map, which was now a few years ago, it was, you know, there was patchwork of 
a territory with all sorts of spaces in, in the single territory was, was really many, many pieces of a territory and kind of a mess. And the, these leaders were able to manipulate and divide the indigenous movement in order to take advantage of them um, and uh, weaken community rights and, and guarantee control over parts of these territory. So what you see in both cases is that territory was central in broader conflicts with the central government and controlling the entity representing the territory was a way to control the formation of the territory as well as its resources and its people. And whether it was the indigenous political leaders or elective non-indigenous provincial leaders in Bolivia, it was the communities really who weren't getting, um, they were getting the short end of the deal in both cases. So bottom line, perfect. Um, this is, uh, it's, you know, the, we have to understand these things we, we think about in terms of agriculture, food security, collective rights, and forests are really much bigger struggles whenever you're talking about land and territory. Um, so another big question that we all have is, will indigenous peoples and local communities be good forest stewards? And uh, so the sub-question being, why do indigenous peoples deforest sometimes? There's been a lot of literature on this. Um, over the last 15 years, I'd say the literature showed very little correlation between tenure, between all sorts of different issues. But recently, I think the study, there's been some really good studies done that are looking at um, titling with really good controlled samples, taking into account distance from, you know, many remo remote areas, of course, are still intact. Um, so there's been some really good stuff, but it's also still quite confusing because a lot of the literature is looking at, um, or what the, what those who argue that the indigenous peoples definitely show that they're very good forest stewards, they argue that the the articles showing something different are simply talking about a title, like literally the title as the thing that should change things as opposed to community organization and other factors that may be behind um, that title. So uh, one of the arguments I've seen in some of the most convincing literature is very much about the community governance structure that also then gets title, um, appears to put indigenous communities in a position where they are doing, they're doing at least as well as protected areas or sort of the next best model. Um, but indigenous peoples do deforest and uh, there are lots of, uh, clearly secure rights are almost better, always better than insecure rights. Uh, so, there, so there's confusion really about what exactly are the, the variables that make a difference. So this is a study we did in, um, from satellite imagery in 23 titled communities in Madre de Dios, Peru, and our question was basically, you know, what, what has been the tra trajectory of deforestation over the last 40 or 45 years? So we compared these, and all of them were titled during that period, so we were able to look at um, the, in Peru, the, the law requires first that you become formally recognized as a community, and then sometimes a year or 10 years later, you get your title. So we looking kind of roughly across these time periods, more or less, 50-50 deforestation went up or deforestation went down after recognition and the same thing after titling. So the title itself and recognition didn't seem to be the key variable making a difference. However, some other things make a difference here. So these are all the, the orange, uh, the orange areas are the indigenous communities um, that today are all titled, though not necessarily all registered, but they're getting there. So, um, our team divided these, basically looking at the results, divided them into three groups. The first group are, are these remote communities. The remote communities, yeah, there's a tiny bit of deforestation, but look at the numbers on the left. These are, this is the annual uh, forest uh, lost. Five hectares, 15 hectares, 20 hectares is the highest you see at all. Virtually no deforestation in these areas. Um, then we look at kind of all the other communities that were closer in, not so remote, but they aren't in the mining corridor, which I'll get to next. And there you really, so the scale on the left is a little bit higher. The highest one goes up to 70, another one goes up to 60. So there's a little more deforestation. It's still pretty low. In these two communities, um, the one with the orange earlier peak shows, uh, it actually corresponds with um, a moment when they started uh, an agreement with a, an NGO that started working with them to do ecotourism. Their deforestation went down and it's stayed level ever since. The green, the green line there that shows a little bit more recent deforestation, 
was a community that had been logging illegally for many years. They got their title uh, right around, I think, 1991 or maybe 96, I forget exactly, and immediately the deforestation rate goes up. But what that turned out to be is they were, they were finally logging legally. They were putting in the logging roads, um, have a contract with a company. They've been logging now there for many years. It's quite sustainable. And the deforestation went, uh, rate went down right after the roads had all been installed. So again, pretty reasonable. Uh, good reasons to be, perhaps, to be deforesting. And you can see some of the dynamics that allow the deforestation rates to go back down. Then we see, on the other hand, this mining corridor. And here you may notice that the scale goes up to 500 hectares per year deforestation, much, much larger deforestation rates. But even when this, within this mining corridor, this is uh, about 10 different communities, the average deforestation rate uh, from over the 45-year periods, the 90, 91% of the forest is still conserved in this area, so it's still quite low. But when you compare, I mean, obviously, there's some communities that are, that are managing just fine being inside this mining corridor and others that aren't. So what's happening in that high peak up there, which is a community called San Jose de Carene? In that community, um, they have 92% of the de deforested area is inside mining concessions. The mining concessions, the government has the right to give out mining to concessions in these areas with or without the consent of the communities um, by law. However, they have also negotiated to, um, to change that in some communities. So currently in San Jose de Carene, I'm not sure what the situation is, but in other cases, the government is not giving out these um, mining uh, permits. But this one had 101 mining permits. Um, and San, uh, the one of the very, very lowest one there, Puerto Arturo, had nine, and they managed to um, come together as a community and agree that they were not going to allow mining in their community. So I think there are actually still a couple uh, mining permits, but they aren't operated, and the community will not let them operate. So community governance, decision making. Um, but there's another big difference, and that is San Jose de Carene is huge. It's a, um, actually, I think it's back on this one. I think it's 100,000 hectares. It's a massive community and a pretty small population, whereas the Puerto Arturo is um, you know, about uh, just a few hundred hectares. This is San Jose de Carene, and it has the half of the territory has mining concessions over it, the light blue lines. Um, obviously, very, very difficult for them to control. This is the gold price. Um, we could go back to that slide, but you can take it, take it on my word that the deforestation rate starts that target, starts that uh, increase exponentially in 2000. It's the same year that the gold price starts going up internationally. So obviously there are some things that the communities really um, don't have under their control. And one thing we don't know is some of these mining permits are for people in the community. We don't know, uh, we have to go back to, to the region to find out how many of these permits are actually for community members themselves. So. These livelihood, these livelihood options are important um, for these communities. So the last section here is on food security after reforms, just very briefly. This was a very, uh, very minor part of our research. We looked at livelihoods, income, and various other things, but I pulled out the food security graphs just because it's more straight on to the topic of this conference. Um, basically, people in communities are very optimistic in Peru about the reforms uh, bringing them new benefits, um, and as well as in other countries. There's often a strong sense that if I get a title, I'm gonna ha my livelihoods are going to improve. But the data is mixed, and really it's somewhat um, of concern, and it certainly deserves more, more research, really, than we were able to do in this project. So this is a comparative study from Indonesia, Uganda, and Peru. Um, we looked at uh, about, well, 55 communities. We did 2,700 house, intra-household surveys with men and women, and we asked uh, lots of questions, but this, again, is the food security question specifically. We asked about changes in perceptions of food security in the past 20 years, and the green ones with the highlight there, we grouped all the types of reforms into these two types, ones where the communities were actually titled or granted full rights in per perpetuity, and ones where they were granted some kind of a use right. And you can see that 
in three of the four cases where there's either a title or a use right, they're doing better than the customary lands, at least in terms of change over time. Um, so again, there seems to be uh, some uh, positive results coming with the reforms. But if you look a little more closely, um, and I've taken off all the ones that have no problem with food security, so these are just the ones with, uh, that say that they have problems with food security for some point, point during the year, and the, the purple is the three months, it's three months or less. So it's, but you know, if you think about hunger, it's a problem if all of these communities are still having major problems with food security. And in this case, um, sometimes the titled and, uh, and use right communities are still, I can't remember if I put arrows on here or not. Let's see if I did. Yes, I did. So the titled uh, and use right communities, these three, are still almost 60%, 50%. Um, huge portions of the community are still having problem meeting basic new uh, food needs. And I guess the other thing that was surprising to us is we tend to think that the full title is going to be a better option. But in fact, um, the data doesn't show that. It doesn't show there to be a significant difference between the ones that, getting a, that are getting a use right and the ones that are getting a, a full title. But um, I suspect, though this is a bit of a hypothesis, that one of the reasons that the ones getting use rights might actually be uh, might be doing a little bit better in terms of food security is because livelihoods is actually a target of the reform, whereas the other reforms are really targeting rights or conservation. So uh, livelihoods is not specifically um, a mandate, and most often what we're seeing really, especially in uh, the Latin America cases, but we hear it everywhere, is that once the title is granted, the, the, the state considers its job done. So there isn't the fo any follow-up technical assistance working with communities to see what, kind, what do they want for their livelihoods, what kinds of development, investment do they or don't they want, but what, um, how can, the, can state, the state support them in their future uh, goals. So just a quick closing. So my conclusion is on this topic is often two steps forward, one step back. There's always uh, backlash uh, to reforms, uh, supporting la land rights for indigenous peoples. So we've already kind of heard tenure security is not guaranteed by certifying, registering, or titling. It's one factor that may increase security. In some cases, it can make it worse. But most often in our results, it does appear to be something people believe in improves their security. There's resistance, backlash, threats, and challenge. It's the norm um, and constantly threatens long-term security. Uh, any change, any progress can be reversed um, in a short period afterwards. What's needed? Strategic alliances with government, donors, NGOs, et cetera, organized communities and federations, attention to governance. These, the governance at the community level defines not only what happens within that community, but what happens outside. It's the strength of the community governance that will support uh, finding livelihoods alternatives and negotiating with outsiders, um, and also guaranteeing that internally there's a fair and equal distribution of resources and rights and participation and so on. Um, I think that reforms need to have a, commi a specific commitment to livelihoods and not only to granting the title um, and support for sustainable options. Thank you.